Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hi, everyone. I'm back with Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Sarah just said, like, as I was hitting record, she said, I need a laugh. And I think that's going to happen in this podcast episode. So I'm just going to tell you, uh, set this up a little bit, what this episode is all about. Sarah and I, as many of you know, become good friends over the last couple of years and spend a fair bit of time with each other outside of recording podcast episodes, Um, mostly wasting time doing nothing. (laughs) So (laughs) hence this podcast episode and this topic for this this episode, which is um, a list that I have been compiling on my phone now for probably a year, six months, I don't know, a year. I've been compiling a list and the title of the list in my notes app is pet peeves. And it's started with a conversation that Sarah and I had about a particular thing. And, and we had just had this moment where we were like, Oh my God, we're t- like, we're totally meant to be friends because we both have this pet peeve. And then it led to us texting each other randomly over the course of the last year or so every time we think of another pet peeve and then asking each other like is this a pet peeve for you too and if it's a joint pet peeve it goes on the list and sometimes even if it's not joint but the other person like appreciates why it would be a pet peeve for the other person it still goes on the list so we have this compiled this list it's quite lengthy Um, But this podcast episode will not be lengthy, so don't panic. But we have compiled a list of all of our pet peeves, and we talk about them all the time, and it makes us laugh a lot. And we both thought that this would just be a fun thing to talk about on this episode. And I think before we get started, one of the things we wanted to just say is that you may judge us for some of these, and (laughs) that's okay. We won't judge you for judging us, but we want to remind you that you have your own list of pet peeves, and probably many of them are not very rational, Um, just like many of the ones on our list are not rational. And we also want to maybe be in advance, we should do like a disclaimer waiver apology. Should we do that? Yeah, just in case. Just in case these things are things that you hold dear to your heart or things that you do regularly. We want you to know that we don't dislike you. We just have a thing about these particular practices slash turns of phrase slash um, behaviors behaviors <laughs> that drive us crazy. So, all right, without further ado, number uh, one. Let's get started with number one, Sarah. Okay, the list. So the very first one, and I I feel like we were sitting on my couch when this one came up, probably doing what we do best, which is nothing. And drinking non-alcoholic gin and tonics and pretending to watch some crappy reality show, but actually just talking about our lives. Uh, Somehow, I don't know what the book reference was, like how we came up with this one, but we both, we realized that we both strongly dislike it. When at the beginning of a book, when you open up the book and you're really, we're both big readers and get excited about books. And I get excited sometimes about big books, like, cause I think, oh, I've heard such great things about this book. And now it's, you know, it's going to take me a while to read it. So I know I've got like some really good time ahead of me with this book, but then you open up the book and right inside it just map. is a map or a very detailed list of characters or a family tree. Just painful. It's painful. It's the worst. It means that you're going to have to go back and cross-reference where on the map the place is, who the person is, how they're related to other people. If I can't get that from the story itself, I don't want to know about it basically. Yeah. It's like, just like a signal to my brain. This is going to be a lot of work. And like, that's the last thing I want to be thinking when I open up a book because nobody's got time for that. Like if I'm reading a book, it's because I, 
I, I want to break. I want to be taken away. I don't want to be working hard. I mean, I do read a lot of things that are hard work as do you for the work that we do. And, you know, certainly over the years, I've read way more case law and other really boring stuff um, that I wish I hadn't had to read. But like when I'm opening up a piece of fiction, I do not want to see yeah. genealogy, a detailed map of all of the different lands. It's the worst when it's like not just one oh. land. There are all these other lands. Oh, yeah. It doesn't even make sense. And it's not on a grid. No. It's like and then there's like you know, this forest and this castle and this whatever. I have I, I have a hard enough time reading a real map in my real life. Like I'm a little directionally challenged. And so I'm not the guy you want reading the map in the car because no. I can't see it. And so I don't want to have to think about where these things are in relation to them in the book. If you can't describe it, in the way that you write, then you shouldn't, it shouldn't be there. Totally. And also I'm not interested in genealogy in my own life. <laughs> so why would I be interested in the genealogy of my characters? Right? Like, that yeah. should be conveyed. I don't feel like I need all of this, uh, these appendices. Yeah, totally agree. And then a couple other things about the maps, just because we're talking about it. This is the point of this podcast. And you might have left us by now. And if you've left us by now, we understand. But a couple Sorry, of other things. We'll have more interesting stuff another time. <laughs> I don't enjoy the fact that those maps are obviously never to scale. So it doesn't even make any sense. Like there's this, you know, the mountains are literally like someone's drawn a large mountain range on there, right? It's like, it's not to scale. And then on top of that, I don't appreciate the compass in the corner because now I'm thinking to myself, okay, when they talk about like how so-and-so is walking westward, I'm supposed to know intuitively that he's heading to the mountain range or he's heading to the whatever. Direction. Anyway, it's too much. I'm going to literally shut that book and put it back on the shelf, even if it won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. I totally agree. If it's got any of those three things in it. So that's how this pet peeve list started. And I said to Sarah, when we had this first conversation, I said, I'm going to start a list in my phone. And I did. And now the list has grown to such a length that we feel like we need to get through it in an episode or else it's going to need two episodes. So who knows? Okay. Maybe it'll be part two to pet peeves. Send us your pet peeves. <laughs> yeah, really. That would be great. I would love to hear other people's pet peeves. I just have to go back though and qualify the fact that the list of characters is okay if it's a play. Oh, if interesting. You're reading, if you're reading a play, somehow a list of characters is fine. I don't know why. Maybe oh. because plays are short. Okay, that's very interesting. That's, I am just gen I'm just generally anti list of characters. characters. Okay. And like you can hold me to this if I ever, ever, ever publish anything period that's something to be, that'll be a miracle but if I do that and I have a list of characters or a map you can come back you can you can remind me of this podcast okay, okay. so that's the first thing I'm going to pay attention to when we started this podcast so we don't go for way too long talking about this Sarah all right so the second thing came out of your participation in some calls on zoom over the course of the pandemic Yes. <clears throat> like to it. Would you like to? There was a um, participant in a uh, in a thing I was doing, a virtual course type thing I was doing, who was um, who was quite a it was quite a serious endeavor. We were all there to learn, and this um, participant had there we all had to have our Zoom cameras on, and we was uh, had headphones on and was on a treadmill the whole time. And so in the, out of, the, we're all sitting fairly statically, you know, you move a little bit, you got some hand motions going on, we're listening, we're engaging. And this person is going up and down and back and forth and kind of, you know, moving like constantly this. in motion and not really pre like not present at all in constant motion. When she tried to communicate what you know participate in the group it was always with the background sound of the treadmill and the feet hitting the and I thought I don't know what I thought I know I texted you a lot during that course speaking being not present but I just couldn't scream it <laughs> loudly enough so I had to text but I was very visually distracted and I thought these <clears throat> you've paid a lot of money for this course and so have we and I don't want to see the your basement while you're you know, oh, and also it wasn't just 
it wasn't just the treadmill. This person was in constant motion. So would be walking around and, you know, changing the music and dealing with her kid and, you know, eating. And it was just all very distracting. And I thought that we really need some Zoom etiquette lessons. perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I did get a lot of texts from you. Um, and they were making me laugh so much, which is why I, I said, like, should I add this to the pet peeves list? And you said, yes. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that you had to have your Zoom camera on was really the problem there, because I suspect this happens all the time, but the Zoom camera's off. And so we don't know. And I'm all for multitasking and I'm all for standing desks and for walking treadmill desks and all of that. I think it's all amazing, but I can see how there's a time and a place for that. And in a group type format where you're trying to work together and, you know, create something together, that would be very, very challenging. And obviously for Sarah, it was very challenging because I was getting rapid fire texts for like a few hours about this. Well, it was also the like, bring the laptop out to your backyard and, exp you know, now we're looking at the sky and then we're looking at the dog and we're looking at, and there's like shifting and, yeah, you know, so turn, I don't, yeah. It's anyway, super I was having a moment. I was, yeah. I, mean, I also am distracted if I'm not, my camera's not on. I'm of course multitasking like everybody else, but when you right. have to be in a group and it's replacing what would be a weekend course that you're yeah. attending, yeah. Yeah. it's a little distracting. It's distracting. So you that's like end up in the shower or in the bathroom or something like that. That's how, that's how right. intimate it felt. Right. So that was number two, walking treadmills on Zoom calls with your video on. Yeah. Have a think. Is this the right time and place for this before that happens? <laughs> Might I be distracting people? And then along with that, dragging your laptop all over the house while you're on a Zoom call with your video on is also highly distracting. I actually do find that incredibly distracting. And again, like just turn your video off if you need to move somewhere. But um, yeah, that's highly distracting. Okay. Next one is very petty, as most of these pet peeves are. I wonder if that's where petty, if petty and pet peeves are connected yeah. um anyway this one's super petty but so damn annoying so this was this one occurred because sarah and i were sitting down for our usual non-alcoholic gin and tonic and not surprisingly it's the only time i drink tonic so it's never in the fridge and nothing's ever cold and we needed ice cubes and somebody put the bloody ice cube tray back in the freezer empty and it happens all the time at my house, maybe slightly less so now that my kids have gone and I'm an empty nester. This was when they were still at home. <laughs> but that is so irritating to me, like so irritating. If it's down to like two ice cubes, you should refill it and just oh, refreeze those cold. two. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had a long conversation about that. I'm not nearly as passionately angry about it right now as I was when it went on the pet peeves list, but that's probably because I don't need an ice cube. <laughs> it's, the, it's a similar it's a similar um philosophy to any jarred item in your fridge uh -huh. somebody puts it back in the fridge with like less than an inch less than less than a centimeter's worth of material in it whatever it is be it mayonnaise or jam or right. whatever they put it back in the fridge when right. you know there's not a full serving or they open a new one mm. and put that in the fridge so now there's two of them in the fridge. One of them is basically empty, but they can't be bothered to scrape out the bottom. So mm. they open a new one. You know, when I do that, this is going to make you mad. I think I'm actually an offender in that area, but only with one type of food, peanut butter. Oh, so yeah. if it gets down in the natural peanut butter, you know how you use the natural oh, peanut butter. When you get down to the bottom, it often is quite hard huh, and yeah. it's not really scoopable. And I like to put, a scoop of, I put like a tablespoon of peanut butter often, like, as you've seen, like I've introduced Sarah to this, actually, this is a delicacy, a breakfast delicacy for me, um, that Sarah now enjoys is plain yogurt with berries. So I put berries in first, and then I put a little bit, it's probably like a third of a cup or so it's not a ton of yogurt, but I put a, some plain yogurt on top of that. And then I put cinnamon on the yogurt. And then I put, um, dried instant oats, like just quick oats. I just scoop like a few tablespoons of quick oats on that and mix it all up. And then I put a tablespoon of natural peanut butter on the top of that. But if it's not runny ish, it's really gross. So I am actually 
the person that you don't like, I think when it comes to the peanut butter sitch, because I do that a lot. And then like right now there are two peanut butters open in my cupboard and one of them has like really hard stuff on the bottom. And the other one is beautiful. What's and the, the hard stuff when you're eventually going to just oh, throw it out. Yeah. Eventually it's going to be me that deals with it. No one else. Oh my God knows no one else in my family is going to scrape that out and then scrub <clears> because you actually have to clean your peanut butter containers out. If they're actually going to get recycled, otherwise they just go in like the recycling people don't recycle them. I learned this from my days in the coastal climate collective <laughs> is that they won't recycle anything that's really dirty. So if it's got peanut butter in it, or even like peanut butter residue, it's probably not getting recycled. So we think we're doing, you know, mm -hmm all of this good work when it comes to recycling, but um, you have to clean it. So it's going to be me that scrapes that sucker out then fills it with hot water and then shakes it up with some dish soap in it until it's clean enough to recycle. I just, I can't do it right now. <laughs> I don't have the capacity for that right now, Sarah. I'm going to leave that. <laughs> I won't hold that against you. Okay. That's enough about that one. All right. Don't worry, guys. Bear with us. This gets better. These are these are kind of like kitchen ones. We have a few kitchen ones. Oh, this one's actually a laundry room, room one. Sarah, did you want to explain uh, the milky towels in the washer? I don't even remember what that was, except that my oh, children seem to think that a uh, tea towel is not used for drying your hands, but used as a sponge or as a uh, as a dishcloth to clean up basically everything in the house. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm not surprised now when I see the dog actually trying to eat the tea towel because there's so much food on the tea towels. Right. So that's cleaning up like spilt milk with a tea towel and then yeah. leaving it. Oh, I know what it was. I do too. Yeah. I thought there was something dead in my, <laughs> I thought there was a rodent in my walls dying slowly <laughs> in my bathroom, which is my downstairs bathroom has my laundry in it. And it took... <laughs> I don't know how many days, how many days did it take to actually figure out that my children had left milky towels in the laundry machine and it smelled like something was dying. I almost had the pest control people in yeah. because it smelled like something was dying. Yeah. Who, who, I don't even think, were they in the washing machine or were they on? I don't even know where they, they were. were in the washer, but they hadn't started the washer. And so the door was, I guess the them. door was open and there were these milky tap, like many day old milky towels in the washer and you were enraged <laughs> at said child who was responsible for this and uh it was just very it was very funny you were very very upset with it so much so that you said put it on the pet peeves list so <laughs> it ended up on the pet peeves list so milky towels in the washer probably not a you know a typical pet okay. peeve a common pet peeve but yeah, but, yeah. um that goes right along with the next one and then i think we're done kind of the kitchen stuff which is the smell of tea towels oh God. it's just a pet peeve like why is it that you can't get those things to smell good it doesn't matter how often i wash them they they always have the smell of a tea towel to them and it it's like goat. yeah a goat, like a goat. yeah <laughs> no, I don't have a goat they smell like a goat yeah they do they smell like I know you don't have a goat they smell like a goat I agree they just smell awful there's kind of like a barnyardy musty smell to them and I guess it's just because they're getting wet and dried and wet and dried so often and it's just it's just built up in there but I I have not yet figured out a way to get rid of that smell Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just, someone's going to write me and say, Wendy, you just need to use bleach. I I'm not a bleach person. I never remember to use it. And I'm always afraid I'm going to mess up bleach. And so I just stay away from bleach. Maybe bleach is a pet peeve, <laughs> but there's probably a way to fix it. But instead I just suck it up and smell the musty smell of tea towels, which I, and I do wash them all the time, you guys. So don't write me and tell me I should wash my tea towels more. I wash them constantly. Okay. <clears throat> this one is going to be contentious. We went back and forth about whether we could even put this on the pet peeves list because we were pretty sure we were going to offend someone. And we are going to offend someone, but just remember this is just us and it just, we don't like this thing and you might love it. And that's amazing. And we get, I think rationally, we both get that there's tons of like amazing value and, and, you know, extrinsic be, maybe objective beauty in this particular genre that we both strongly dislike. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, it's one of two things, really. Okay, well, it starts with a J. Would you like yeah. to announce it? 
Sorry, folks. It's it's jazz. <laughs> it's jazz. It's I have just, to say, like, uh, just stop. <laughs> just <laughs> jazz needs to stop. You have to understand, like, I have probably have 2,000 records in my house. My husband's a music aficionado. He has to play jazz when I'm out of the house because I lose my mind. There are certain kinds of jazz I can handle, like Ella Fitzgerald jazz. I've got, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But the, the whiskey, it never ends. It's like, it never ends. It goes on and on and on. And it's the same sound and it's over and over again. And I, I can't oh. abide it. Like I just, I can't do it. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have, <clears throat> I'm a Philistine. I feel equally passionate about jazz. I like about I'm anti-jazz. I'm equally passionately anti-jazz in that I agree with you. So I think like melodic or lyrical jazz is different, but the jazz I'm thinking of that I can't be with is the jazz that is sounds like nothing belongs together Ugh. like it's, it's just it's very and I I get it like there's something wrong with me there's nothing wrong with jazz there's something wrong with me I'll totally there's something wrong with me too yes I, will, I just I'll I, can't, own that. I can't and I, I really love music I consider myself to be quite a, a pr music appreciative in a musical person <laughs> but I can't do it so I think this is one, like, we were like, should we say it? Should we not say it? But now I think we just need to own the fact that we are, yeah. we are just, we are not, a, we are not cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will never be jazz cats. Mm -mm. And we can't. Just the word jazz cats <laughs> makes me <laughs> cringe. It makes yeah. me think of fedoras and, and um, what are those? Yeah. Those big yeah. saxophones. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, totally it's not it's like boys who are trying to dress up as men with like a like a, a hat that's just not anyway oh my god that we could go on obviously about jazz we could have just done a podcast episode on why we dislike jazz but we're not going to do that because we know that many of you enjoy jazz yeah. um but feel free to let us if you're let us know if you're on side with this pet peeve because we really struggled with whether we should even leave this one on the list. Okay, that's jazz. There's another one down the, the way that we struggled with whether, and there are some, just so we're clear, there are some, many that we were like, we cannot ever put that on the pet peeves list. So yeah. there are a whole bunch that will never be discussed or disclosed. Okay, so moving on. Oh God, is this the other one? Oh, I don't know. There's more than one, I think. Okay, so this is mine. I brought this up. Thinking I was the only weirdo who didn't enjoy ever and kind of had this like black and white view. And I recognize it is very much a black and white view, which is not great ever, but I have it about anything to do with the Great Depression or riding trains. I can't read a book about the Great Depression if it starts off and it says something like, you know, and then the whatever, and it, it's like, obviously the great depression, or if it's like the, even the thirties generally is a hard decade for me to get into. Uh, What's about the riding of the trains, the riding of the trains. Okay. So I connect it with this. That's why they go together because I, for, I feel like I've read several books. I know I just said, I don't read them, but it's, I don't read them anymore because I read some of them and they were like, it was like death by a thousand paper cuts to read these things. Like it was not fun for me to do it. So books that combine the Great Depression and then the hobos that rode the trains during the Great Depression, right? It's all about that. I, don't have anything, I have nothing against hobos, nothing against hobos or trains in particular. I actually love trains. And interestingly, Sarah, you'll find this interesting, but I'm writing this piece of, of fiction for fun. And there's this whole piece where I, ride a ride the char main characters riding in a sleeper car at on a train and it's all riding the train so apparently I can write about riding on trains but I can't read about riding on trains so anyway um I feel like there's one exception to this which is El uh water for elephants I think a lot of that book took place on trains and I was cool with that if I've got this book, exception, which is Kristen Hannah's um uh four winds which was the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. Okay, so I also read Four Winds. I Did got you know through, 
No, I, I did. I enjoyed it, but I had to really talk myself through this bias at the beginning of it. Like, because I really like Kristen Hanna, uh, especially her recent stuff has just been amazing. And I, I knew there was great potential in this book. I had read The Great Alone. I had read The Nightingale. And I was like, this is going to be good. She's pretty good at historical fiction, which I'm not going to put historical fiction on the pet peeve list because that's too big a category. But I do generally, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. I have a little bias against historical fiction. Like it, it, it's got to be good. So I really had to talk myself through it and just sort of force myself to read the first hundred pages of it, even though it's really well written. The characters are great. It's so good. There was this thing in the back of my mind. I was like, they're going to get on a train because they kept talking about trains. <laughs> I'm going to get on a train and a piece of this book is going to take place on a train and I am not going to like that. So I really had to coach myself through that. <laughs> I wonder if in a past life, are you, could that have worked past life wise? Like maybe you were killed on a train in a, the Great Depression. Listen, I believe all this stuff. I mean, I don't think the Great Depression was fun for anyone. That's why they call it the Great Depression. So, you know, and it's, it, I, I, I don't know if it's that I don't want to read about a sad time. I mean, usually there's a like comeback story in this where, you know, things get better in the roaring forties, but like I, roaring twenties, no, it was not the roaring forties. I, I don't think the, the war, war happened. Boring. Never mind. The war. Post-war. Anyways, yes. Post things don't get better for a while. Things don't get better for a while. But I think, I think I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what it's all about, but I did read that book and it was good. And I have read books that are good about people on trains, but I think I'm just, if I read on the back cover, this book, this is a wonderful book about, you know, two, two men's friendships cultivated riding the trains during the great depression. That book is going back on the shelf. <laughs> I am not taking it home. Now, I feel like you were with me on this. I feel like you're hanging me out to dry here. Were you not with me on the great depression? Yes, you uh, were. No, I'm 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 not with you on the trains. I don't have a reference point for the trains. That's your okay. own stuff then. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think maybe the great it may have been about a specific book. That may have been and we but I can't remember what it is. So okay. Oh, anyway, you know I'm what? You to the dry. Paragon Paragon, oh, Hotel. Paragon Hotel. That was where the trains came in. We were talking about Paragon Hotel. And, the and it was during the depression. Yeah. And I couldn't yeah. get through it. Okay. I did finish that book. It is a good book, by the way. I don't want to suggest it's not a good book. It is. And if you don't have the hangups that I have about riding trains or the Great Depression, you'll love that book. Um, but for me, it was a, it was a tough one. That is my own thing. I own it. I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it is a past life. Okay. Next one. Dry falafels. <laughs> Sarah and I are both vegetarian and have eaten a lot of falafel in our day. And um, there's such a thing as a falafel that's too dry. Sucks and it's liquid right out of your mouth. It's not good. It's not it's good. Not good. Yeah. So a dry falafel went on the pet peeves list because there's nothing really worse than spending, you know, your $11 on a good falafel sandwich. And then it's just so dry that you you're having to like glug water in order to get it down. So it's a small one, but it's, it's small, small, but it, it was a common pet peeve that we have this next one. Not so small. I feel like they're going to be people out there who are our people who hear this one. And they're like, yes, that is me. So the next one is light touch. Like Sarah just cringed when I said that. So what we mean by light touch, if you're not sure, is a gentle light. Stroking. Stroking. <laughs> light. Feathery. A feathery physical, you know, endearment. Butterfly kisses. A butterfly. Oh my gosh. I did used to do those with my kids when they were little for fun. But it's that, it's funny because I think it's, so I don't know if it's, anything to do with female hormones. Like I, I'd love to know more about this light touch thing, but I have heard from many women who have are going through or have been through perimenopause and are kind of on the other side of it, that they got more and more sensitive to touch as time went on. So maybe it's that window of tolerance thing that we talk about around caffeine and alcohol and temperate heat, you know, how it shrinks. Maybe yeah. our tolerance to touch shrinks as we get older too, but I can't 
handle it. And for me, it's actually been for like, for a really, really long time. I don't like it when someone I'm doing it right now, you can't see me. Yeah, it's making me uncomfortable. Actually I'm stroking my hand and Sarah's like pushing physically going oh. back from her screen as I'm doing that. But I don't like that, that really light, the really light touch from, yeah. I just prefer pressure. I prefer, I actually don't, I prefer just like, if you're going to hold my hand, just hold my hand. Mm -hmm. Don't stroke my thumb. Mm -hmm. Don't do anything else with your fingers. Just hold. Oh. Yeah. Ugh. Don't, yeah. Don't do it. Just hold my hand. Right. Yeah. And with like, I prefer firm massage. I don't like a light massage. I'm definitely not into any kind of like the light kind of stroking -y stuff. Anyway, Sarah, how do you feel about it? I hate it. I've always hated it. <laughs> hate light touch. It kind of, it, it fires up my nervous system is what it does. And it makes me angry. Ooh. So when people like, when I, when there's light time doing it to myself right now to just say, <laughs> but if someone comes along, if one of my kids like strokes my arm really gently, I actually want to punch them. If, but it's, it's not, I'm not angry at them. It's more like a physical reaction. It's like, stop, like just stop that. It's very reflexy for me. It becomes kind of a reflex. So everybody in my house is schooled that like, I would need a palm touch. I don't want fingers. You want like, just put your whole hand on me. That's what I want. I want to feel, it feels grounding as opposed to like, I don't know. It sounds really neurotic when you say it out loud, but it's, I hope that other people can relate. It's, it's, I've always been this way. I couldn't believe it when you said that. I thought it was just me. And I thought it was my kind of sensitive nervous system and that I was, I was yeah. the one who was the outlier. And perhaps you and I are the outliers, but I, I do, I do not like, what about, what about your friends? Have you asked this question? So, of your friends? Yeah, I've had a couple people say the same thing, but I'll tell you where I noticed it is with my daughter. She's very alike. So I wonder if there's a genetic component to it. Like if it's actually just really super sensitive skin epidermis, like mm -hmm. she, she prefers, like we, we call them squeeze hugs in our family, but when we give a hug, it's like a real hug. Yeah. It's a super hug. And I think she also is not a fan of like the light touch and the, you know, like she, but so I don't know. I don't, I, 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 I don't know how many other people feel this way. I've definitely had a few women friends say, yes, I don't, I can't do that. And when you were like, yes, when I said like, we were both on the same page with this, I thought we need to talk about it because, you know, we never want anyone to feel alone. And this is, what it's, it's but I think it's also it, this one in particular, I've, I've really had to sort of educate my family so that they're yeah. not my partner in particular at the beginning. It was just like, it's not that I don't want your touch. It's not that I don't want you, your affection. Yeah. I just want you to declare it. Like, yeah. don't, you know, don't kind of just, I don't want little light strokes. My yeah. whole body just goes like this. There's just, it's a really reflexy thing for me. So, yeah. Yeah, and me it, it makes me not want, want any touch, you know, I'm yeah, just me like, too. Yeah. Do it right. Don't do it at all. Yeah. And you have to kind of a, almost apologize for it and make it really clear. Like, this is not yeah. about you. Like, this is a real thing. And I have a hard time. Like my husband is, does not really believe me. I don't think sometimes I really like, so maybe he'll listen. He sometimes listens to this podcast. If he's listening, if you're listening to this one, it's a real thing. And it's not just me. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was one, that was one. I feel like the next one's probably going to make some people annoyed. So, okay, whatever. Um, the next one is, and this was yours but I got on board with it. Basically I've taken this out of my life altogether and it'll probably never come back, but I feel like for you, it might still be there sometimes, which is, or it's, it's more fresher in your memory. And that is camping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I feel like it's a binary thing. You're either a camper or you're not <laughs> yeah. like, you know, or, or you're not a camper, but you're pretending to be a camper. I right. pretended a few times. I had the very, I was very fortunate to have grown up going to a cottage mm -hmm. as a child. My family has a cottage here as well. Um, and uh, I, I've never enjoyed sleeping on the ground. Mm. Just not my thing. And also when I have taken my kids camping, which was only twice to be mm -hmm. fair, it was so much work. Yeah. It was more work for me than sitting here at my table. Right. making a meal, like having to, it, the benefit versus risks did not pay off. Yeah. The risk being that it's just way too much work for me. So I'm, I don't know. I'm just not into it. Yeah. Just that's, that's what we were talking. You know, we were definitely focused on the whole work thing and how you like, 
oh God, it's so much like just thinking about it is making me feel heavy because <clears throat> there's so much involved in like the food preparation. And like, then you have to carry it to wherever you're going. And so it can't be too much, but you also don't want to be starving because you're going to be outside the whole time and you're gonna be hiking and you're gonna be doing all of that. And, and then just all of the like packing and like everything comes home and it smells musty and your sleeping bags are wet. And there's all this like afterward stuff. And like, I have great respect for the true campers out there who love it and do it. I think it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm, I'm envious of them, frankly. I am envious. And, you know, I grew up like working at a camp and camping and being outdoors and, you know, building lean tos and stuff like that. And I guess, you know, at the time, maybe it just felt like I romanticized it and somehow it was okay. I was also like 17. So <laughs> there's that. Um, and I wasn't dragging like, well, I was actually dragging kids, but they were campers <laughs> when I was working there. So I guess I did have kids with me. Somehow is just different camping with my kids. And I think I've only done it like maybe once. Like we we never really did it. It was not. And it's interesting because if you had asked us before we got married, we would have said we were going to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> it just did not end up happening. Really so, but, you know, I, I for some people it's, 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 it's everything. And I 100% respect that. And I think you're so cool. And I wish that I was that, but I am not that. I'm the kind of mom who would pitch a tent in the living room and call it a camping weekend. So, mm -hmm. but actually I wouldn't even do that. That's a lie. I've never done actually that. just send my kids with other, other people who yeah. are campers. Right. Who right. right. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. And, and they're, they, you know, that's the two times I did go camping. I went with a particular friend who's a very good camper and, you know, she made it pretty, she made it pretty easy for me. She gave me her lists. We did mm -hmm. all the right things, but um, ultimately I just say, when are you going camping? Cause my kid's coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Moving on. Um, this one, the next two, I would say are connected. Maybe we can draw some parallels back to the great depression and riding the trains. This one, I think is mine. Mostly it was, um, Westerns, anything Western, like, I mean, I'm not saying I don't like people from the West. That's not what this is at all. I mean, like westerns as a genre so i don't enjoy western movies western tv shows western literature especially historic westerns Where so, they oh and they're riding a train forget it forget about it i'm not even gonna think about it no i don't and my husband it just drives my husband crazy because he you know, there are lots of amazing movies, apparently. <laughs> I wouldn't know because I haven't watched them, but amazing movies that are Western movies. And I, he'll suggest one to me and I'll just be like, no, I ne not a chance. I'm not watching that thing with you. Is that a Western? Last night I came in from, <laughs> I was out with my son who's home for reading week. We came back in the front door and I heard the TV and I said, that sounds like a Western. <laughs> In a really, really bitchy voice. And it, wasn't, it was actually law and order. Like it wasn't a Western, but I'm very sensitive to the Western. Now I will say I watched all of Yellowstone and I loved it, but it's not historical. And also it's got Kevin Costner and some other quite attractive people in it. So that might've <laughs> kept me going on it. Um, but it is definitely Western. They are cowboys. They're on a ranch. Uh, but I, I somehow could get into that, but like, I think it's more like the historical Western. And then if you combine it with the next pet peeve, again, forget about it. It's not happening. So the next pet peeve, well, before we go to the next pet peeve, how do you feel about Westerns generally? Are you with me on this or am I alone in this? I've never gravitated towards a Western. I have no, I just, <laughs> I, I haven't even like, it's so off my radar that I just I would never, ever choose a Western. I would mm -hmm. never, no, it's just, it's so just, to, just I can't even give it the pet peeve energy because <laughs> I don't care. Right. Well, here's the thing about the Western. As I'm thinking about this, I'm like, what is it about the Westerns that I don't like? I think it's, it's similar to a lot of the war movies that I don't enjoy. And, and this is a generalization. Obviously there are some exceptions to this rule. I'm sure I, I haven't watched them because I stay away from the category altogether. So I'm probably ripping myself off here, but I think they're very, very male yeah. 
very macho, very male oriented. Masculinity. The characters are all male. It's like a male storyline. There are no strong female leads in it. They're often just like, you know, the floozies in the bar. I can see them, you know, the saloon doors open and there's like the, the gal in the back who's like, you know, half prostitute, half barmaid or whatever. Like it's ridiculous, but I think a, p- a big piece of it for me is the fact that there aren't, there's no strong feminine. And I don't mean feminine, like I just mean feminine in the true sense of the word. Like they don't have any strong female characters that I can identify with. And, and the storyline is often really, like you said, really kind of masculine and macho and kind of like, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of a gunfight. I'm not a fan of any of that stuff. And I don't like, I, I often like stay away from war movies for the same reason. I mean, I, I find them very violent and sad often, but also it's probably that they're, you know, they're often are, the cast is mostly men and it's just a male kind of focused and driven plot. Am I crazy about that? Do you think? No, I think you're, I think you're making when, the, in terms of the Westerns, I think you're making broad generalizations Sure, it's on a genre that you have never actually watched. <laughs> However, I would agree with the is it a, can you call it a trope? I don't know. They yeah, know. The whole <laughs> cowboys and you know all that is very yeah. toxically toxically masculine, toxic masculine, and whatever. Yeah, is feels like it, yeah. we don't resonate with it. Let's no, it <laughs> no, it's not my vibe. Okay, the next thing, if you combine it with the Western thing, again, it's a no go, uh, and that is a black and white movie. And, yeah. you know, I, I want to love a black and white movie so badly because I get that the only difference is that it's not in color. Like, I get that. But I just am, I recoil from black and white. Even the ones that have won, like, the Oscars and stuff. I, I think I've watched them, but I recoil from them in the beginning. And I just, I'm going to avoid a black and white, I'm going to avoid a black and white film, TV show, which they don't really make anymore, but I'm going to avoid those. And you feel, I feel like you've had some progress. You've made some progress around black and white. Yeah, it's take, so um, my husband is a a cinemaphile and uh, makes movies and that's his living. And so I, um, it's taken me a long time to come around to the classics. We used to to say, he'd say, is it, It's like, oh, it's in black and white, is it? Because that's what I would say. I'd be like, he'd say, well, you want to watch this movie? I'm like, is it black and white? (laughs) So I did have a bias for sure. However, I have to say that in my maturity as a post-menopausal woman with more space in my life, I have decided that I'm going to make an effort to explore other things that he is interested in as well and um and see if see how that feels other than jazz I will put that judge jazz is not that in that category at all I don't feel open to that however (laughs) I did say we were talking about horror films because my eldest is into horror films right now Mm -hmm. and we decided to watch the Hitchcock movies and um and they're in black and white right they were great I haven't watched all of them but and I definitely felt myself coming around. Mm. I think part of it, to be honest, was about distribution of time. So before this stage of my life, Mm -hmm. I only had a certain very small amount of time to sit down and actually watch a movie. And I wanted to watch a movie that I wanted to watch. It didn't, it didn't matter. It was just like, if I'm going to spend this time, I'm going to do the thing I want to do. And so now I feel like no, I actually feel like I want to explore this other thing. And certainly there's a reason why other people love classic mm-hmm. movies. There's mm-hmm. they're classics for a reason. And so- perhaps, And jazz. Okay, jazz <laughs> is not, I'm not open to that. Okay. <laughs> I will admit, I will admit, I will often be out for hours and then mm-hmm. come home and jazz is blaring on the uh, turntable. And I know that my family, maybe my, not my eldest child, but my the other two are listening to jazz behind my back on mm-hmm. purpose because right. they know that I won't complain about it. But so I'm I'm willing to take that off my pet peeve list. Actually, it can stay on yours, but yeah. I'm, uh, I'm willing okay. to take it off because okay, I'm, we'll- I'm growing as a human. And I'm, and I'm trying, not, apparently I'm I didn't say that you can interpret it that way, but I did not say <laughs> that. But myself, 
I'm trying to grow as a human in terms of my interest. Okay. Well, you're an inspiration to me, Sarah. Um, okay. So the next one, I honestly feel like everyone, but it can't be everyone who thinks this is a pet peeve, who has this on their pet peeve list, because then there, there are the people who do it obviously don't have it on their pet peeve list. So anyway, if I'm about to offend you, I'm very sorry, but this drives me and both myself and Sarah completely bananas. And it is people who refer to themselves in the third person. Oh my God. Do you need to say why? anything? Why? why? What's that? Why would you do that? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Why? Like, why do people do that? Oh, Johnny's very cold today, you know, says Johnny. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just weird to me. And it's always been weird to me. And I don't know why people do it. But as soon as I hear someone do it, it's, or I read it somewhere, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. Like I, that person is no longer someone that I want to hear anything more from. Like, it's just, it's so visceral to me, the reaction that I have when people do that. And I don't know what that's about because people do all kinds of weird things with grammar and speech and all the rest of it. But that, for some reason, that one just takes me down every single time. Yeah. I totally agree. I have no reason for it. I don't know why people do it. I feel badly if it's some, you know, dissociation or something that it's like some sort of psychological thing that they need to do. But I feel that it is, I just don't understand. I just, I, I, I look at them with, with a look that says, I don't understand why you just did that. That's right. I this, just one, see, this one sounds like, judgy. This, people. This one, we're sounding a little judgy in this one compared to the other ones. So I don't want to dwell on it because I don't want people to think we're super judgy. I, I just, we don't understand it. I think that's what it comes down to. And the reason I think why it, it grates on me is because it sounds childlike to me. So there's something about referring to yourself in the third person that sounds babyish or something. There's something about it. Do you, do you, do you know what I'm saying when I say that? Or does that not make sense? No. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. What I don't it know. It's like, it's like a parent talking about their child, except it's you talking about yourself. And it's just weird yeah. to me. Anyway, we can move on, but that one was definitely a common, <laughs> uh, common pet peeve that we have. Now this one, I apologize to all the mimes out there, but we do not love a mime. I don't understand it. <laughs> I don't understand why that, that, that again, makes me feel like I'm not very cultured. No, so, and I can't fully, cause I have friends who are in the, in the theater world and I'm mm -hmm. sure that they understand the deeper meaning behind a mime. I don't get it. Just like I don't understand interpretive dance. It's similar. I yeah. Just it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, for the mime, it's like, you know, I can get behind like a mime for a couple minutes, but and that's probably a stretch, but then I just sort of lose, I lose interest in it. Did and you see any mimes when you were in France? I always no. put your mimes on the streets of France. I, this, I think that's a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a stereotype. I haven't never seen one mime. Well, maybe one mime, but I actually don't think it was in France. I feel like it was in Belgium or something. And I saw a mime on a street, like with the typical, like, you know, striped shirt and the little like scarf yeah. tied on the side of the neck and the beret and the white face and the whole thing I think I saw that once in in it, but it was not actually in France I'm not sure I've ever seen a mime live on the streets in France anyway I mimes I might be a bit afraid of mimes what's that I might be a bit afraid of mimes are you so, like well, it's well, like a clown fear it's like a clown fear yeah it's a clown fear and you also I feel like you can't communicate with them mm. Unless you're communicating in mind. Like, like, I wouldn't know how to say, stop following me and making funny things to the crowd. Like, I'm afraid that I'm going to be the person that they're going to signal out, signal out, what's, that's not the word, that they're going to, yeah, um, yeah. yeah that they're going to choose from the audience because yeah. I have that total look of fear on my face. And so yeah. that they're, I'm going to be the one they're going to target. And yeah. before I know it, I'm going to be like caught up in some mime drama. So, <laughs> oh my God, as we're doing this, this list is cracking me up. Like it's so petty and ridiculous, this list. Okay. The next thing, but we're going to keep going anyway, because that's how we roll. So the next one, <clears throat> could be tied to jazz but really could just it's a standalone it's not particularly tied to any genre and the only band that I'm going to make an exception for on this is Dire Straits because I think they're the only ones who can get away with it no <laughs> you don't agree 
know. No, I Long can't. solos inside other songs. Oh, God. So when you're listening to a song and you're really grooving on it and it's got a great melody and you're singing along and everything's great. And then there's a long saxophone or guitar or something solo that just takes you out of it for way too long. Mm -hmm. And it feels a little self-indulgent on the part of the, you know, soloist. When those go on for too long, it drives me bananas. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Just Mm -hmm. like check off a double on that one. Yeah, it's just it ruins it ruins the whole flow. It really does. It, it, to me, it's it's narcissistic. Really. I wonder how uh, we should ask your uh, your partner there about how he feels about long solos being the the musical buff that he is. Yeah, uh, let's ask, and you can report back on that. But I don't know uh, that I've ever heard him listen to a song that has a long guitar solo. To be honest, yeah. um, they're they're they surprise you. Like you think they're not going to come, and then they come. You know. And here's the thing. They're more likely to happen in a live, in a live recording. Yeah. And I don't like a live show where that happens either. It just, yeah. it drives me crazy. It takes me away from it. I'm, I guess I'm just, I'm such a, a melody melodic kind of person that I need the, I, I need the thing to happen that my brain expects to happen next. And I don't like the disruption of it. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. We're almost done guys. You have done so well. If you're still with us, we appreciate you. We just, we really guys, we're doing this because we needed to lighten the mood a bit. Like there've been a lot of serious podcast topics lately. And Sarah and I often talk about really, you know, more serious things. And so we just thought let's do something fun just to break it up a bit here. Okay. Everyone has pet peeves. Everyone has pet peeves. Everyone has pet peeves. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're just airing ours because we air everything else. That's right. Okay. (laughs) So I put on the list, I said anything, this is the next pet peeve, anything quote curated or bespoke. And then Sarah added or artisanal. So it's really a trio of descriptors. Yeah. It's bullshit. Uniqueness or somehow being special or better. Yeah. No, we don't like No, there's nothing special, better or artisanal about anything anymore. It's all, everything's derivative. It's basically a piece of toast with avocado and an egg. It is nothing artisanal created or, or, or about that. Mm -hmm. So those words are just, they've, everything has lost its meaning. Yeah. They're overused. And uh, now just like, uh, I'll tell you, bespoke has always been irritating to me. Because, and the reason I don't like bespoke is that it's not used that often in North American English. It's used more often, I think, in, in, you know, maybe in Britain and the UK, but it's just not a common word here. And so it always sounds put, put on a little kind of snotty or something. I don't know. There's something about that word. It's always bugged me. Again, I take this. This is my, this is my issue, guys. It's nobody else's issue, but it's always bugged me. Just feels a little like yeah, like there's some kind of, I don't know. Anyway, um, so we are going to just leave curated, bespoke, and artisanal on the list as words we don't love. And uh, by the way, I'm sure I've used all these words. So please don't come back and say, well, Wendy, you said bespoke when you said this thing before. I, well, bespoke is probably not one I would have used, actually. But I may have used curated. Because the thing is, that word is actually a helpful word if it's being used in the, like, if it's really true. And you've taken like a thousand things and you've curated them down to the 10 that are actually the things that people need to need to know. Mm -hmm. And it's a useful word, but it frustrates me that it's so overused that it's been diluted and it's not, it's, it's no longer has that, has that power or impact. I think that maybe it used to as a word, Mm -hmm. we're getting way too into it here. Okay. Moving on. Okay. Another word, Sarah, Sarah does not believe that she's ever heard this word used so this is 100 mine and i'm going to own it but i can't stand it when people say brava when someone has done something good nice creative whatever and people yell out brava it drives me nuts and i don't know why do i feel the same about bravo i'm not sure i don't think so i don't think bravo bugs me as much it doesn't there's something (laughs) what's that you spend any time in Italy? Oh, listen, if it's actually the word of the, the, like the, the language of the country I'm in, that's a totally different story. It's when people in like, you know, I go to like 
the theater in Halifax and someone yells out Brava, that's when it bothers me. Or, you know, <laughs> someone's giving a speech or something and someone's like yells out Brava. Uh, it's not, I'm not talking about Brava being used properly and contextually as part of a language. I'm talking about a English speaker. Primary language is English speaker using the word Brava. Does that make sense? Yeah. Again, totally on me. If you use the word Brava, don't worry about it. Uh, it's just going to irritate me. That's all. And I don't know why. I don't know what it is about that. Okay, Sarah, you can wrap it up with the last pet peeve. And you guys are probably very grateful. This is the last one. The last pet peeve is the one that you told me about. You sent me a picture. So oftentimes these pet peeves, as we're putting this list together, there are accompanying photos. And there was an accompanying photo. So I feel like Sarah's, Sarah has sent me a number of uh, photos of the insides of books as of I, where there is a map or a character list or genealogy since the very, the very first pet peeve got added to the list. And this last one, you also sent me a photo of, and this is the one, it is the the... The, the butter. Yeah. Talk about the butter, Sarah. Why can't anybody in my household unwrap the butter? They dig in the, they, they barely take the top off and then they start to dig with forks and knives and spoons in the butter when it would take what, I don't know, 20 seconds maximum, 20 seconds of your whole life to unwrap the butter, especially when it's hard, when the butter's hard, it's easy to get it off. When it's soft and you get down to that last little bit of well, maybe, maybe nobody else experiences this because their people actually take the foil off the butter. But there's that last little bit, the stringy piece of foil that has the butter on it. And you don't want to waste the butter because butter's $8 a pound. Yeah, it's expensive. You don't want to waste the butter. So I'm like, scrape, I'm covered in butter, scraping the butter off and just cursing everybody in my house. And then we had the added bonus of the fact that my family are Marmite eaters. Ooh. My husband is English. And uh, so they, uh, for those of you who don't know what Marmite is, it's this gum at the bottom of the beer barrel that they eat, that they um, scrape off and then they eat in, uh, in England and it's called Vegemite in Australia. Yeah. And it's yeasty, you're either a Marmite lover or you're not, okay? I'm sure we'll have lots of comments from the Marmite lovers, but you're either a Marmite lover and you're not. And if you've never been brought up with Marmite, your chances are you're not a Marmite lover. I think it's- Are you a Marmite lover, Sarah? Yeah. No, I hate Marmite. <laughs> My children love it because they were brought up on it. So anyway, so then Marmite's very sticky, kind of a little bit even stickier than molasses. So then you have the, you have the, the streaks of Marmite in the butter and then the streaks of peanut butter mm. also in the butter. Mm. And it's all still wrapped in the tin foil. The foil. Yeah. And yeah. so honestly, this is more than a pet peeve. This, it, depending on my mood, yeah. can be like, I'm leaving my family kind of irritate level of irritation. Sarah has her index finger out and is waving it around as she's telling me about the streaks, the streaky butter in the it foil. Might, it might be one of, it, yeah, it may be one of the things that the milky towel was, you know, kind of an isolated incident. <laughs> this was, <laughs> thank God for your family. Thank God. It was isolated. <laughs> this is this is like well how often do you go through a thing of butter we eat a lot of butter in my house so you know every few days there's something happening with that butter mm -hmm. and um, frankly i need to chill out about it mm -hmm. but i don't know how mm. so if anybody has any suggestions about how to chill out about the butter problem yeah other than just making it one of my price of admissions yeah i was about. just going to coach you through it here sarah i've got a yeah. couple yeah. tips we've actually i don't know if you've been on the podcast where i've talked about these strategies for like letting things bother you less, but I feel like both of us could take a dose of what I'm putting out there around this, because these are all, these pet peeves are all places where, you know, you can just choose to care less um, and you can consciously work on just caring less about it and noticing what happens if you don't respond or freak out about the butter and how does that make your day better? Not freaking out about the butter and, you know, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, I think we just are entitled to some pet peeves and mm -hmm. it's okay to have some of them and, and we ate some of them too for other people right and so we 
wanted to come on and talk about these things just to normalize the whole pet peeve thing. I think both of us would like to be very clear. I'm so careful about all this stuff now because I am waiting. Basically, social media has me waiting to be attacked for stuff. So I would like to make it very clear that we recognize that these are very small, almost negligible issues and problems and that they're very petty and that there are far bigger, more important problems out there that both we have and other people have that we don't have. And so we're just talking about petty, stupid stuff here. But these are the things that have been going back and forth between Sarah and I in rapid fire text now for the last year. And we we feel confident that some of them are shared and we're going to get some responses from people saying, yes, that's my pet peeve. And even if you don't share our pet peeves, we know you have your own pet peeves and they might feel really small and petty and silly to you sometimes too. But um We've just gotten such a a kick out of talking about these things over the last year that we thought it would be fun to come on and talk about our respective pet peeves. And now I'm going to clear the list, Sarah, off of my notes app and we'll start afresh. Okay. And we'll see what ends up at what ends up. And if people hate this episode, then we'll never talk about this again. But I would love to hear other people's pet peeves. Yeah, me too. Because I'm certain that we share. If you're a a regular listener to the two of us ramble on and you actually enjoy listening to us, which you might not after this episode, but (laughs) if you're a regular listener and you can relate or you have some others, I'm certain that we share those. I'm Uh certain there are lots that we share and I would love to know what they are because I'm sure every day it's filled with little, little irritants. Yeah. And I do let a lot of stuff go. I do choose to let so many things go, but I I don't think I can ever let, I just don't think I can let Westerns go. I don't think I can let the the riding on trains in the great depression. I I just don't like most of the things on this list. I don't know, like Brava, maybe, maybe I can get over Brava. I'll start working on that. You guys, but the rest of them are probably here to stay. So that's it for us today. Anything you want to add, Sarah? Do you feel like we've done this topic justice? No, no, it's it's been good. I got got the laugh that I needed. Makes me laugh. And, you know, we all need a good laugh once in a while. So that's true. All right, everybody go out there. Have a good day. Don't let things bug you too much, except for maybe your pet peeves. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a burnout and balance coach, I help busy high achievers like you create a more balanced, joyful life. Ready to create a life you don't want to escape from? Download your free Blueprint for Change now. This incredible workbook includes some of my favorite coaching tools and will help you get clear on what you need more and less of in your life. Grab it at www.wendymccallum.com forward slash blueprint. That's www.wendy mccallum.com forward slash blueprint.